The title of this message is, Why Should a Born-Again Believer Attend Church? Now, I know you're thinking, boy, that's a silly message, but you know what? For some people, it may not be. Before we can answer that question, however, we must first understand what a born-again believer really is. Now, I know you all are thinking that you know what a born-again believer is, and I'm sure you do, and most of you, if not all of you, are born-again believers. But the thing about it is, we have a lot of people watching us on YouTube today, or when this thing comes out, uh, that may not understand what it means to be a born-again believer. So a born-again believer is someone that has felt the Holy Spirit tug on their heart with conviction. And that person has moved on that conviction by believing in their heart that Jesus is the Son of God and that He died for them. By calling out on His name for mercy. By repenting of their sin. By confessing that they are a sinner. And by accepting God's free gift of salvation. They were born again. Amen. So with all that said, if you'd like to stand. We'll get to the reading of God's word. The question is first though. Are born again believers immune from sin? Everybody in here ought to say the two letter word. No. All right? No. All right. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11. I'm going to read into, like I always do, I got some NLT and I got some uh, King James Version today. Paul says, When I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. But I wasn't talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or are greedy or cheat people or worship idols. You would have to leave this world to avoid people like that. Verse 11, very important. I meant that you are not to associate with anyone who claims to be a believer yet indulges in sexual sin or is greedy or worships idols or is abusive, or is a drunkard, or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people as that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear precious Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you this morning, Lord, and we thank you for your word. We thank you for this place to come and worship. And Lord, we thank you for this wonderful country that you have given us to live in and the privilege of being able to be born and raised in this country, Lord, because your hand of blessing has been upon this country, Lord. And we continue to your hand of blessing to continue to be upon this country, Lord. We know the country is turning away from you, Lord. So Lord, we pray that you'll just anoint our lips and our jaws, Lord, and help us, Lord, all of us, Lord, to spread your gospel, Lord, to spread your word, to talk to people, Lord, to witness to people, Lord God, so that we can get more and more people under your umbrella, Lord, your protection, Lord God. We pray this morning, Lord, that you'll bless this little message, Lord. We pray, Lord, that, that someone here or someone online will hear the word that they need to hear, Lord God. We pray that you'll anoint those ears, Lord. And Lord, we're going to give you the honor and the praise and glory for everything you do today. We love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' holy name we ask, amen. You may be seated. When you, as a born-again believer, are around lost people for a period of time, you may begin to notice a few changes in your spirit. If you're around people that have foul mouths, your mouth may start to sound like theirs. A lot of times we get around people that we believe are Christians. You know, people that always go to church. They have appearance of being holy. But they may have a dark side to them that you don't know about. They have a dark side to them. First, you may notice that they can talk about going to church with one breath. And have a foul mouth with the very next breath. If you mention or ask one of them when they were born again, this is always the cliche. This is the what kind of shows where they're at. They will usually look at you like you're crazy. Because they have no idea what you're talking about when you say being born again. But if you ask them when they got saved, different story. Everybody knows what that is. And just about every one of them will tell you something. 
They'll tell you something. And that is usually when they were a child. They got saved when they were a child. Maybe 6 to 12 years old. And with that response, they will always say, and that's when I got baptized, or maybe I got sprinkled as a baby. I know a few people like this personally. I'm certainly not saying that you can't be born again as a child. I'm not going to say that. There's no way I could say that because I truly did get born again at 10 years old. I was in church all my life. I got born again. I could take you to the very spot in the very church and show you where it happened at. But it's not like that for everybody. Everybody's not the same. But there are a lot of people that think or in some cases thought that they got saved early in life. And that they were truly, and they were truly born again later. My wife is a perfect example of this. She was in church from basically birth all the way up to her late thirties, and she thought that she was saved. She went to church all the time. She helped in Sunday school. She done all those things. But when she visited a different church. A church that taught the truth of God's Word. The church that was bold. The church that was not worried about stepping on somebody's toes. When she went to that church, guess what? She got under conviction. And she found out that she was not born again. She was not saved. She didn't know what born again was either. We've had this talk a lot. But she got saved. She got born again. She got born again. That made her very angry as it should have right i mean if you've been deceived that long and then you find out something different wouldn't you be angry you should be you should be so she was very angry about that she had attended a watered down church that did not speak the truth and she will tell you right now that if she had died while attending that church she would have split hell wide open there's a lot of people in this same boat. A lot of people in this same boat. So I want to insert something here before I go any further, and it's going to get me in trouble, but that's all right. I stay in trouble. All right? I believe. Now, what do I say when I say I believe? Do your own research, right? Okay? That this is my opinion. That's all it is, my opinion. I believe that when preachers and pastors sprinkle babies at birth, baptize young children that are not mature enough to know what they are saying or doing for that matter, I believe that those pastors are signing those young people's, young children's eternal death certificate. I believe that they are. Now you may think, Brother Mark, that's cruel. That's mean. I can't believe you said that. Let me tell you something. God didn't call me to be a nice guy. He didn't call Stephen back there to be a nice guy. He didn't call Tyler to be a nice guy. Nope. He called us to tell the truth no matter how hard or how bad it hurts. He calls us to tell the truth of His Word. It makes some people mad, but that's what He called us to do. A lot of people in our society today were sprinkled or baptized as a child. The Catholic Church does it all the time. The Lutheran Church does it all the time. Uh, Tammy knows about that. My wife grew up in a Lutheran church. But you know what? Even Methodist churches do it. You know what was amazing to me when we were going back through all the things that we had to do in order to switch this church from a Methodist church and, and pull out of it? There was papers and stuff in there I found, and, I, and I'm working off memory, so I might not have this exactly right, but the, the way I took it was that in the Methodist church, if a person or a child had been sprinkled or baptized as a child and then later made another confession or something, you pretty much had to have permission if you could even baptize them again or you wasn't even supposed to baptize them again. Is that the way it is, Peggy? Okay. That's the way I read it. That is pathetic is what that is. That's pathetic. Okay. I kind of I put those churches in the same boat, but they're not all. There's other denominational, denominational churches that do that, and there's other churches that are not denominational that do the same thing. So those children, think about this, for those children grow up thinking that they are saved. 
And as long as they don't venture outside of that church that they grew up in, they will never know the deception that Satan has them under. They'll never know it. And when they die, they're lost. And they will go to hell. The phrase, the, the verse that I use all the time, Jesus said in that day, talking about the day of judgment, I use it just about every Sunday. It's a great verse. In that day, many, many will say to me, to, to Jesus, Lord, Lord, did we not, did we not um, do all these things in your name? And he will say, I never knew you. This is what we're talking about this morning. I never knew you. Have you ever wondered why that when a new preacher comes to a church, how that the first month or so that that preacher comes to the church, there are a lot of people that will come into that church that hasn't been to church in several years. They'll come in and they'll, they'll check him out. They'll listen to the preacher. They'll see if this preacher want, is saying what they want to hear. What they want to hear. Or if this preacher steps on their toes. If so, they leave and they don't come back. And sometimes they even badmouth the preacher. They just didn't like him at all. You know, this guy, he's a crook. He's, he's whatever. Sometimes they just run him down in the ground. This church is no different. When I got here, same thing happened. For the first month or so, we had people coming in from all over the place. I thought, my goodness, if we can just keep all these people, we'll, I don't, we'll have to build on. About as soon as they came in, they went out. Apparently, they didn't like my preaching. Okay? It is what it is. <laughs> well, there's a few that stayed. <laughs> I didn't run everybody off. Oh, me. So what we have today is a lot of people in this world that think they are Christians because they were, now get this, because they were told, they were told at an early age that they were saved. Tyler and I helped out on some youth fest over in Greensburg a few years ago. And uh, I always instructed the ones that was going to help work the altars and stuff. I said, no matter what you do, for one thing, it scares me to death to deal with children. It really does. Because I, I have to try to determine if that child is capable of understanding what we're talking about, because I don't want this scenario to happen to them. I've known about this for years. And I instructed each one of them, I said, no matter what you do, what they say, you never tell that child you have been saved or you're born again. Don't tell them that. Let them tell you that. What happened to you? Let them explain it to you. So many people does that. Well, you just got saved. Well, what's that kid going to think? He just got saved, right? So what happens? What happens? Here's where the danger lays. When preachers baptize immature children, Satan will always tell those children all the way through their adult life, just like my wife, you are a Christian. You are a Christian. You're saved. You're good. When they get the feeling that their toes is getting stepped on in church or they start to get under conviction, what's Satan going to say? You've already been saved. Do you remember when you got baptized? You were sprinkled as a baby. You're fine. You're fine. And a lot of people won't come to the altar. Satan's got to keep his deception going. But I can promise you one thing. Satan will never come against that person like he does a Christian. When you become a true born again Christian, Satan is on you like stink and I won't go no further, but you know what I'm talking about. All right. He's on you and he's going to do everything he can to torment you, to keep you from learning anything about God. Not, not in this situation. No, Satan's never going to go against you. He's going to say, you're a good Christian. You're a good Christian. You're fine. You're a good Christian. You're a good Christian. But when they go to a church that teaches the truth of God's word, Satan will sure enough fill their heads full of all kinds of reason why they should never listen to that preacher or go to that church again. Now the reason I think God gave me this message the other day 
is I was recently around several people like that, several people like this description. And I was around them for quite a while. And also, some of the people that uh, didn't even claim to be born again, I was around. And I noticed that after a few days of being around the filthy mouths, the greedy intentions some of these people had, and the pride of their stuff, oh, look what I've got, that's all I care about, I began to feel angry, agitated, just had a feeling come over me. And, and this is not the first time I've ever uh, experienced that evil spirit. Experienced it a lot of times. So let's look at our text again. Let's get into this a little bit. 1 Corinthians 5, 9 said, and Paul's talking here. He says, when I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin, but I wasn't talking about unbelievers, key point here, who indulge in sexual sin. Or, or greedy, or cheat people, or worship idols. You would have to leave this world to avoid this. So what is Paul saying here? He is saying that you have to live in this world. You don't have a choice on that. But you are aware that those people that are lost outside the church, the ones that are lost running around, that are doing all these crazy things, you are aware of how they live. You're aware of that. But the thing about it is, when you're aware of that, you know not to act like that, right? If you're in church and you're a Christian, and you know that the lost world out here is drinking and partying and doing all these things, you know they're lost. I don't want to be like that, right? But what if those people that go to church act like or think like they're saved but live in sin. Paul goes on to explain how to handle these people in verse 11. Now he's, he's talking about people that we're just talking about, all right? People that are lost, but think they're saved, they, but they go through the same things. They still have that sin nature in them, so what do they do? They sin a lot. They just kind of keep it covered up. So what he was telling them is, beware of people like that because something could happen. Here's what he says. He says, I meant... You are not to associate with anyone who claims, 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 keyword, to be a believer, yet indulges. What does indulge mean? Enjoys, likes, right? They want it. Indulges in sexual sin or is greedy. If you're always talking about your stuff, you're kind of greedy. Or worships idols. Sometimes your stuff becomes idols. I know people that worships their vehicle. They think more of it than they do God, so I guess that's what they do, right? They worship their vehicle. Or is abusive or a drunkard or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. Now, why in the world would Paul say that? If the church allowed those people to continue living like that while claiming to be Christian, and other Christians, especially new converts or new Christians... If they look at them, they might think, well, you know what? Brother so-and-so does this. Brother so-and-so does that. Brother so-and-so. So, you know, if it's all right for him to do it, it's all right for me to do it, right? Especially if you're a new convert. That's what the way you're going to look at it. Paul knew that those people would contaminate the other churchgoers with that sin virus. And the church as a whole would be sick and useless to God's plan. If you or I are around evil, the evil spirits of lost people, you and I will get an infection from them. It's just like if you go around somebody that's got a cold and they're coughing and hacking right in your face, chances are you're probably going to get a cold, right? Okay? Okay. Flu the same way, COVID the same way. It'll make you sick. Same way for spiritual walk. If you're doing things you shouldn't be doing because you think it's okay because somebody else is doing it in the church, it can kill your spiritual walk with God. It won't kill your soul, but it will kill your spiritual walk with God. Just imagine, for just a minute, that the entire world, and it is, contaminated with a disease called sin. 
with a disease called sin. This disease is highly contagious. I always remember this, one thing about sin. All right? If you sin, it will take you further than you want to go, than you ever wanted to go. You can't just sin and that's it. It's going to take you further down the road. It's going to draw you to whatever it is continually. If you sin, it will keep you longer than you want to stay. Always. If you sin, it can destroy your communications with God and will if you keep doing it. It's like this. If you put on a white shirt, white pants, and white shoes, or in the case of a woman, if she puts on a white dress and white shoes, and then she goes out to a muddy old hog pen where there's a bunch of hogs running around and tries to walk through it, is there any way that she's going to, or they are going to come out of it with not having mud and dirt all over them? It's kind of impossible, right? Kind of impossible. So that's what we're talking about today. Because the whole world that we live in is that nasty hog pen. That's what it is. It's a nasty hog pen. The first message I preached here back in December 12th of 2021, it was entitled, The God of This World, kind of like the Prince and Power of This World, which was all about Satan himself having control. He does. He has a lot of control. Okay? And he is a nasty old hog. And this world is his hog pen. All right, so we need to look at it like that. When we Christians have to go out in that hog pen, remember, Satan knows your weaknesses, all of them. If you have a problem with alcohol, lust, filthy mouth, Satan will try to get you around people and things that can distract you. He wants to put you around people that is drunks or any of the things that you have a weakness to. Because he wants to try to get you to act on your weakness. Satan will try to get you around those people. So he can distract you. So he can tempt you. Or make you as a Christian. This is very important. Make you as a Christian look bad to people of a lost world. You've heard me say this before. That me personally... I don't think if a person can drink one beer with a steak or something, that it's a bad thing. Okay? The problem is, if anybody that knows that I'm a preacher sees me drink, and I'm not going to do it because I'm not, I don't want, you know, it ain't worth it. It's, it's not that great of, you know, stuff. Coke's fine too. All right? But if they see me drinking a beer in a steakhouse, what are they going to do? Well, it's all right. It's a, hey, Brother Mark's drinking beer. I can drink beer. Let's go get a 30-pack. I think I said that three weeks ago when I was here. Let's go get a 30-pack. It's all right because he does it, right? Well, that's the way people look at things. So Christian, uh, they look at us. Satan will always try to snare you into one of your weaknesses. Never, never forget that. We are in war, folks. We're in war against Satan. We didn't ask for it, but he brought it. So you know what? Somebody comes to my house and tries to take over. I'm going to do everything I can do to defend my house and put him down. Same thing here. Satan comes after you. Be aware of it. Know as much. Be studied up and read up and ready to go up. Because he will attack you. Because that's, that's what he does. That's exactly what he does. He will try to snare you into your own weakness. And the lost will quick to call you a hypocrite. I have went to so many people over the years, visited people, and walk up and talk to them about church. And you know what they say? If you mention what church, because they're going to always ask, what church do you go to? Well, I go to this church. Eh, I don't want to go to that church. It wouldn't matter what church I said, but I don't want to go to that church. Well, how come? Well, Billy Bob that sits on the front row up there every Sunday morning? Yeah, he's there every Sunday morning, but he was in Lebanon at the bar last night. He's a hypocrite. There ain't nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. How many times? Anybody ever heard that before? Okay, I've heard it all my life because that is what Satan used. He's a hypocrite. 1 John 2, 15 through 17, King James Version says, 
Love not the world, neither the things that are of the or in the world or of the world, depending on which translation. If any man love the world, the love of the Father, Father God, is not in him. When you love those things, you love that. God's not in you. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, not of the Father, but of this world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. This is a very short little dressing room that we're living in. Compared to eternity, the world is the eternity, and this is our little short time period here. This is a dressing room. This is a school. This is a preparation room. Okay? We sometimes think it's going to kill us to try to do things sometimes, but you know what? If we would just remember, eternity is forever. No end. It's either going to be good or it's going to be horrible. Can't even imagine the horror. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Be careful what you say or what you hear or what you listen to. Proverbs 25, 26 says, If the godly, now today it would be born again Christians. When Proverbs was written, it would have been the Jewish people and still is, but we also fall into that category now. So if the godly, the born again people, give in to wicked, it's like, now listen, here he tells us exactly what we're talking about here. It's like polluting a fountain, like a fountain of water. It don't just pollute one drop here and there. It pollutes the whole thing. Or muddying a spring. It ruins it. So as Christians, what can we do to protect ourselves from Satan's advances living in this evil world? What can we do? Psalm 119 verse 115 says, Get out of my life. You evil minded people, for I intend to obey the commands of God. In other words, don't run around with or associate with lost people that take God's name in vain all the time, or are always sinned, or are drunkards, or adulterers, with one exception. One exception. Here's the exception when you're trying to witness to those people, go for it. Okay? But don't, don't be their buddies. I mean, you can be friends to everybody, obviously. But beware of getting too close to those people. Witness to those people. And if you're witnessing to them, they probably won't want you around very long anyway. That's usually the way it goes. Probably won't want you around. Psalms 26, 4 and 5 says... I do not spend time with liars or go along with hypocrites. I hate the gatherings of those who do evil. I refuse to join in with the wicked. Never, ever, ever mistreat somebody that's lost. I'm not saying that by no means. Never, ever mistreat any of them. Just keep your distance so that you don't get infected with that spirit of sin because it will rub off on you or our nature that we are born into this world with is a sinful nature. It still tries to linger in. Our mind, our soul still has that garbage in it. That's the reason it's so important. It is important to get a, a child before they get out into the world. <laughs> it's very important to get them saved if you can. Get them born again. Because the older they get, the harder it is to get the mess out of their mind. Okay? Okay? If they get born again, these people that we're talking about, they can be your best friends if you want them to forever. But you've got to be aware of what you do. You cannot let this infection get in you. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and 15, Paul gives a warning. And he says, Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live in darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? 
How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? Now this passage is obviously Paul telling Christians not to marry unbelievers, but it also reaffirms that a Christian should not be in, in, with a business partner or partner up and be the best buddies and everything that we're talking about with somebody who's lost either or hang around those lost people. They will contaminate your spirit. So what can we do? The answer to the question of our message is, and here goes, just as we can get infected with, in the world with a sin virus, we can get healing and cleansing in church with spiritually like-minded people around us. God's Spirit is in all true born-again believers. His Spirit is in them. When you are in a church regularly, you build up an immunity to those evil viruses. It's because you are around like spirited people, godly spirited people. If you don't attend church and you are constantly around people in school or the workplace that have Satan's spirit in them, you will get infected. And you may backslide. A lot of people does this. You may backslide. You will not have as great a desire to learn God's word. You will begin to lose the desire to even come to church. It's hard on me being out of church three weeks trying to come back. It's hard on anybody. Okay. Satan's always got a bunch of garbage planted between you and church if he possibly can put it there. After a few weeks of letting your guard down, you may find yourself doing things that you normally would not do, especially if you're around the wrong kind of people, and also saying things that is not in God's nature. The more you can be around other Christians, the closer you can get to God, and the more you hear His Word, the closer you can get to God. And be removed from this world. Being in church and studying God's word is as often as possible is like getting a vaccination against the sin virus. But it's not by some government. It's by the great physician, God himself. One other point uh, to remember here. As we are instructed to become disciples of men, attending a Bible teaching church will help you develop into a tool that God can use. God wants to use. We have a responsibility. When we become Christians, we're not to come in here, sit down, do nothing. We have a job to do. Amen. Okay? It is to witness. It is to talk to people when you can. That's our job. 1 Peter 2.21 uh, 2, says, For even hereunto ye were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us as an example, that you should follow in his footsteps. And some translations pretty much says, Take up the cross and follow me. And, and uh, yeah, you're going to go through sometimes. That is one of the reasons why Satan's pawn, I believe, you know what I say about I believe? I believe created COVID-19 to shut down the true Bible-believing churches. All of us that have been in church for a long time know that when we are out of church for a few Sundays, it gets very hard to pick ourselves back up and come to church. We know this. As much as I hate to say this, Satan is no dummy when it comes to deceiving us. He knows what he's doing. So in closing, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek His will in all that you do, and He will show you which path to take. If you'd like to stand, Michael, if you have a... Song of Invitation.